This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 867, recorded on February 15th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 27 Fahrenheit, which is minus 5 Celsius, and it's sunny, mm. so it's nice. Yeah, it's sunny here, but it's uh, it's currently minus 2 Celsius. This morning at, say, 7, it was minus 9.5. That's pretty cold. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. We got uh, 73 degrees and sunny. It's gorgeous. And uh, Tinkerbell is likely to show up before the show is over. She's over in my min- my inbox right now. She'll move and you, you have a real inbox. You have a physical inbox. Right? I have a physical inbox. It's like where you put letters. Well, you know, people do. <laughs> uh, occasionally I do get mail, okay, that needs to be dealt with. And that goes in the inbox. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, currently 28 Fahrenheit, which is being converted to minus 2 Celsius. I'm not sure that's exactly right, but uh, this morning it was um, 15 Fahrenheit, which is minus too many Celsius. Um, it's clear and cold. I think that's right. I think 28F is minus 2C. Minus two. Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty close. So most- yeah. My, yeah. My 27... Well, it's not the same app that converted it. It was a different ah, app. Okay. So, yeah, that's why. Yeah, the conversion is unfortunate. Too bad we don't have just one temperature scale. Uh, that would be boring. Fancy. Yes. Yeah. Well, we have multiple measurements, We right? Yeah. Uh, yes, we don't want boring. So today I remembered what uh, time it is, uh, not what time it is, what the date is. Most days I look at the show notes, I say, okay, it's January 2nd. And then when I go to do the intro, I forget what day it is and I have to look at the show notes. I don't know why. Maybe because they're there. It's kind of a crutch. But uh, today I absolutely knew because yesterday was the 14th, which was the, the this faux Valentine's Day, right? The Hallmark holiday. <laughs> oh, it, it's way more than Hallmark. It it's more than Hallmark? Yeah. yeah. My daughter said she went to uh, the supermarket yesterday and checkouts were lined with men checking out boxes of chocolate and the checkout people were saying did you get a card did you get a plushy toy <laughs> <laughs> it's all marketing it's, all it's marketing. like you want fries with yeah. that yeah. yes <laughs> would you like to supersize that bouquet yep uh yes so it's more than that yes but it's a nice way to say a hallmark holiday right it's an hh Okay, Kathy Spindler, what have you got for us today? Uh, two PSAs. One is about Abracams, which is the annual biomedical research conference for minority students. And Abracams is launching something new for selected high school students who've conducted formalized research, community college students, and first-year undergraduates, so people very early in their career stages, to present at a meeting on Saturday, April 23rd. It'll be a virtual meeting. And this will help get them uh, geared up for the regular Abercams meeting, which is in the fall. And that meeting is uh, April, no, sorry, uh, November 9th to 12th in Anaheim. So uh, abstracts are due for this April event, March 15th. So beware the odds of March if you haven't yet submitted your abstract. You need to get it done by then. Uh, the other thing that Abercams is doing is that they want to promote professional development of early career scientists. And so they're encouraging graduate students and postdocs to sign up to be abstract reviewers and judges. And of course, as always, they'll uh, ask or have anybody who's an active researcher be a volunteer. So uh, I think, Vincent, you're going to put links to this in the show notes, but you mm-hmm. just contact Abercams. To, uh, if you want to be an abstract reviewer or a judge, there's a certain link for that. The second announcement is about ASV. And as I announced already another time, ASV registration is now open. 
Reminder of a couple of upcoming dates. Abstracts are due March 1st. Travel grant applications for students, postdocs, and teachers of undergraduate virology are due March 3rd. If you want to apply for ASV CARES grants, which are to help uh, for dependent care during the meeting, you could have uh, extra money to help uh, take care of your dependent at home or take them to their grandparents or something like that. Um, So those grants are kind of on a rolling basis. And then we had planned in 2020 at Colorado State to roll out our first ever on-site daycare. And we're trying that again this year. Um, And so that'll be with a third party company and the details will be forthcoming very soon. We're just working on the last of the website details between their website for registration and our websites. So uh, we want to encourage all kinds of people to come to the ASV meeting. So for all those details, the link is simple. Just go to asv.org and follow the links to the meeting. That's great. So you can leave your PI at the on-site daycare and then go present your post. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. Right. Yep. All right. Thank you. The, the links will be in the show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Uh, before we get on to our paper, I have a little follow-up from Friday's TWIV. Amy was talking about echo viruses and the fact that echo, E-C-H-O, stood for enteric cytopathic human orphan virus. And I was looking in, I have some very old books in my office, one from 1965. It's not very old, but it relatively. It's older than me. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I had a, student, a student came up to me Sorry, I knew yesterday. That would, I knew that would hit. Yeah. 65. A student came up to me in class yesterday and she said, I was born the year you started at Columbia. I said, okay. <laughs> anyway, so I have this book, um, Viral and Rickettsial Infections of Man, the fourth edition, which I think was published in 1965. And uh, it is a viral and rickettsial all in one book, right? It's a big book. And it's so heavy. The paper, you know, it's that glossy paper, very heavy. Must weigh five pounds. Anyway, I wanted to look up uh, some some things about cross-reactivity, but I came across this chapter by Dorothy Horstman, which is uh, the chapter on the coronavirus group, it's called. And she writes, she's, she writes about echo and the naming. And then there's a little footnote at the bottom. And here's the footnote. Quote, the name orphan, a poor taxonomic term, was devised by those who mistakenly thought that an agent to have a place in the sun should be responsible for an identifiable disease. End quote. I love it. I think that's great. I would also say that for 1965, that's almost prescient. Right. It's brilliant. You know. It is, yes. I love the way she's saying, you're wrong, guys. (laughs) Yes. You're wrong. Mistakenly thought. Uh, It was, I think it was Albert Sabin who used that a lot. And uh, anyway, that's where, and she's right because, uh, and, and in her text, she says, the idea was, you call them an echo, and then you figure out what they cause later, <laughs> if if anything. But then she said a lot of these echo viruses cause a lot of different things, so you can't name them any. You can't name them like poliomyelitis virus, right? So, and that was uh, that other, was back uh, before we had the whole discussion about naming things after where they were discovered. Yes, yeah. yes. The other uh, orphan, the other group that has orphan in the name is Rio viruses, right? Respiratory enteric orphan. Yes. And these are basically things that were what discovered in culture or something like that. And they don't, so they're not associated with a disease, at least upon discovery. Right. But you're right. All the viruses in us that apparently don't do anything. uh, Yeah. You can't call them all orphans. Anyway, I like the way she says a poor taxonomic term. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's great. Anyway, Dorothy Horstman, by the way, uh, spent uh, many years at Yale University working on polio virus, and she discovered. The viremia, the blood virus in the blood during the polio virus uh, infection, which, um, you know, people couldn't figure out how the virus got from one place to another. And you, you're thinking, well, really? yeah, it's a long time ago before we understood this stuff. So, Do you know when she was at Yale? I think uh, 
before you were there, probably. Yeah, I'll have a look. I met her once at a meeting. Yeah, very very nice and smart person. I was, yeah, I, long, this. I was there a long time ago. You could look it up. She <laughs> probably has a Wikipedia page, right? Uh, I'm looking here. Dorothy Horstman, Yale School of yep, January. She's got a wiki page. She died in 2001. So, yeah, you can look there and see when she was at uh, uh, Yeah. She died in New Haven, so I guess she just stayed there. She lived there and stayed there afterwards. 1911. Nice town. Okay. She showed me, I have to show you this poster one day. I have a poster in my office. So the meeting I met her at was a meeting in Washington. It was the first meeting I went to uh, after leaving MIT, and it was about poliomyelitis control. And all the big names were there. Salk and Sabin, and she was there, Joe Melnick, and oh man, it was like a who's who. And they had a, they made a poster for this meeting, which was the Egyptian steel that you're all familiar with of the priest with the with the drop foot. And then underneath it was a black bar, and the name of the meeting was printed in white on the black bar, right? Poliomyelitis control, Washington, DC, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she pointed out that, Vincent, do you notice the black bar doesn't go all the way to one edge of the poster? I said, no, I actually didn't notice that at all. <laughs> <laughs> she said, that's because the black bar represents polio control. We're almost there, but not quite. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we're still not there. No, we're still not there. <laughs> not quite. Interesting. That's a, I still have that poster. It's very cool. It's red with black the the, the uh, uh, Egyptian priest is black and this bar is black, and so to this day I now look at it and I and I remember her telling me that isn't that funny? I mean this is 1981 or something like that. So um, it says here in the Wikipedia page that uh, she was chosen as a full professor in 1961, mm -hmm. making her the first woman to receive that position at the medical school. And that she was named to an endowed chair in epidemiology and pediatrics in 1969. Uh, so I did indeed overlap with her. Not, uh, but you know, I was in a different department. I forgot plus how I old was, you are. <laughs> plus, I was clueless. Okay. So, yeah. and she died at the age of 89, January 11, 2001, in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, so, if she was made a full professor in '61, she had been there a few years. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I just love that, that little line there. I had to tell you about that. Yeah, it's great. All right, we have a paper today. It is a journal pre-proof. So peer-reviewed, accepted, and being, being put into the right... So there are data, but it's pre-proof. It's pre-proof, before the proof, yes. which is where it's all put <laughs> into... We still have the TypeScript, yes. right? The PDF. Yeah. And the figures were all at the end. So they haven't put it all nicely together. Yeah. Well, you know, I hope they have room for a couple of suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like they don't label almost any y axis of right. any graph. They put the put they put it in the title. It's so annoying. Yes. Which is Hopefully it which is fixed, yeah. exacerbated by, of course, the legends being in a completely different place from the figures. So you look at this figure and say, oh, that's a, wait, what is that? Scroll, 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 yeah, scroll. Yeah, there's no y-axis. Yeah. And, and there's other stuff that's not in the legends, like those purple, red, and blue dots at one yeah. point. They're in the next part of the figure <laughs> legend. No, so despite these issues, I think it's an interesting. Oh, yeah. it's very interesting. It's a very interesting yes, we, yeah. we just started off with just, a couple of pop right. nits to yeah, pick. Uh, but, uh, uh, there are many... SARS-CoV-2 papers. I thought this one was particularly Oh, yeah. This is great. I'm glad we're doing um, this. And uh, the title is Respiratory Mucosal Delivery of Next Generation COVID-19 Vaccine Provides Robust Protection Against Both Ancestral and Variant Strains of SARS-CoV-2. Now, there are two first authors, Sam Afkami and Michael D'Agostino. And the last author is Zhao Jing from uh, McMaster in... Uh, Canada and uh, Southern Medical University in Shenzhen, uh, and there's another McMaster. Okay. Yeah, it's mostly McMaster. Yeah. 
It's one author from yeah. Shenzhen and everybody else is at McMaster. And there's about a bunch of authors. Mm, to, yeah. In between. But. There's a lot in between. Uh, so this is uh, trying to make a next generation uh, COVID vaccine. And as you know, we have, well, they, they, they put this number here. At least 100 vaccines have been tested in clinical trials and 180, another 180 under preclinical yeah. development. And as you know, the, we have a number of vaccines that have been deployed in large numbers. Uh, but the question is, are we going to see next generation vaccines? You know, the existing vaccines work very well, as they say, against uh, severe disease, but not so well against mild to moderate. And maybe that has something to do with uh, the emerging variants. So, um, you know, they say we don't really like the idea of making a variant specific <laughs> vaccine because then we're in the flu story where you have to predict and then maybe you're wrong one year and, and so forth. So let's do something better. And on top of that, let's think about putting the vaccine in the respiratory tract instead of uh, in the muscle, which uh, makes makes perfect sense, yes. right? Uh, and and um, on top of that, let's pile in some more antigens. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then so, add I mean, more antigens. In these, are, these are concepts that we've talked about uh, on numerous occasions before. What if you, you know, maybe you ought to have something more than just spike there. And what yeah. if you uh, 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 were to administer it um, nasally or by some other route? And this paper does all of that. Yeah. Yeah, in as, an animal as, model. As we know, uh, yes, this is in mice. Uh, in, in, uh, there seem to be a good role for T-cells. So, so they say, let's get some uh, proteins that have T-cell epitopes in them. Right, and the, and so the advantages them. of putting it in the nose um, are easier delivery, obviously, uh, but also the getting mucosal immunity would be a big goal because then you've got, you know, as soon as the virus encounters somebody, it, it hits an immune response yeah. rather than yeah. waiting for it to get to the bloodstream. And of course, Alan, the nose knows. The nose knows, yes. For the best reason. I, in that same book I mentioned, the rickettsial and viral infections, I was reading the, adeno, the rhinovirus chapter, and the rhinoviruses predominantly reproduce in the nose. <laughs> Hence rhino, <laughs> yes. Which is probably true, but it's a funny way to say yes. it. Most people say nasopharynx or something. Anyway, back to this paper. Then on top of it, they decided to use adenovirus vectors. And um, they they say because, you know, in part, you can deliver these to the respiratory tract and they, they do induce um, mucosal immunity. We know that. And so they're uh, going to, to use that and they're going to do it all in mice, and this, at least in this study. Uh, so uh, let's let's look into this. This is quite a data-rich paper, mm -hmm. a lot of experiments. They do, uh, um, they, they kind of flip back and forth in talking about the variants. Um, so I think they mostly use the number designations instead of the Greek alphabet designations. Yeah. But they do, right at the top, they point out uh, the, the correlation. So, um, and this is open access, so you can get to it. Yeah. So I have a, uh, I have a question for y'all and Kathy in particular. Uh, this arises in the discussion, but I'd rather out it at the front of the paper. Uh, and that is uh, whether there's any uh, particular perceived advantage in terms of a, uh, a, a mucosal vaccine, a nasal vaccine, in using adenovirus as opposed to some other uh, sort of technology like lipid nanoparticles. And I don't know the answer to this. I mean, it, adenoviruses seem logical because they're designed to, you know, in fact, I don't know, uh, mucosa, actually, right, Kathy? Uh, right, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the answer to your question either. The question that I had running throughout the paper was, um, why is the chimpanzee one so yeah. much better? Yes. And yeah. they give some reasons for that at the end, and, and I've already spilled a little of the story to you, <laughs> yes. but... Um, yeah, it's okay. Spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah so one of the, so one the, of the things the, with adenoviruses, you you worry in humans that we've all been exposed to adenoviruses. So if you shoot an adenovirus, human adenovirus based vaccine into a human nose, there'd be a pre existing response to the vector. Um, and so here they test both the human and the chimpanzee in mice who shouldn't in mice. have had human adenoviruses. Right. right. And 
some for some reason, yes, in the mice, the chimpanzee seems to work better. The other argument they make uh, about this route of uh, infection with the adenoviruses is that even though humans can be seropositive for some of the common adenovirus vectors, that the uh, it's uh, uh, less likely that they would have high titers of IgA, mucosal antibody. Okay, so you might be able to uh, sneak in your transgene by a nasal uh, route mm. um, uh, with an adenovirus vector more efficiently, for example, than uh, an intramuscular injection. That's, I th think, largely theoretical based on some published data in the right in the discussion. Yeah, as we'll see, we'll, it's a little more nuanced, perhaps. But, mm -hmm. you know. uh, so they're they're using two adenoviruses, human serotype five. Uh, and chimpanzee serotype 68. So they're going to test <clears throat> multiple SARS-CoV-2 proteins in these vectors, the spike full-length S1 domain, which has both the N-terminal domain and the receptor binding domain. In addition, it has other, it has uh, multiple T-cell epitopes. Which um, uh, and which chimpanzee adenovirus serotype is in the Chadox? 68, is, is that, that right? So 68 in the paper. Oh, oh which is Chadox? Right. I don't know. It's the, I think this is the same one it's as Chadox based okay. on the way I read it. That was my impression too, but... Okay. And the S1 is fused to the VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus glycoprotein transmembrane trimerization domain that, because it's only the S1 part of SARS-CoV-2 spike. It's not doesn't have the transmembrane. So they're putting a VSV transmembrane and the trimerization so it trimerizes... Uh, and gets uh, targeted to the right vessels. And then they include nucleocapsid protein, the whole nucleocapsid N protein, uh, and NSP12, the part of NSP12, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And they have T-cell epitopes, right, largely. Which at least those are going to be uh, important for um, uh, in pathogenesis, I would say. You're going to make antibodies against them, but I'm not sure that they would have any effect as far as we know. And knows. the N is the most highly abundant protein in infected cells, is I that right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, I don't know, to me, the RDRP seems like a logical target because maybe it's relatively conserved. Yeah, yeah. I, I That's know. That was my assumption. In particular have, for yeah. T-cell epitopes or something yeah. like that. So, uh, here's uh, one of my first sort of editorial gripes, yeah. and that is that there's all sorts of alphabet soup in this drawing and uh, no definition uh, <laughs> or very little definition. So, it says it's driven by, uh, it, there's a little green box upstream that says M, uh, MCMV. I assume that that's a mouse cytomegalovirus promoter, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that's yeah. an assumption. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, TPA. Should... What the heck? Oh, that's a uh, no. What is that? They say what that is, but I forget. It's from some virus that I figured Vincent would know. <laughs> so the uh, yeah, the TPA is so the the <laughs> nuclear oh, No, 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 it's a signal sequence. That's right. TPA oh. is the signal from uh, right. uh, uh, plasminogen activator. Okay. Tissue plas plasminogen activator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the other question I had was they've got the VSV trimerization domain. Yeah. On apparently the C, uh, let me see. Oh, that Next. would be the C terminus. Okay, yeah. fine. Next that makes sense. S1, yeah. The C terminus of spike. That makes sense. Then they've got this yeah. P two A, right? Uh, which is um, uh, a self cleaving protease. It's not a protease. It's a self cleaving sequence. Self-cleaving um, sequence. Okay, fine. So yeah. this so whole pretty, thing yeah. is one polyprotein. Yeah. Spike, yeah. nucleocapsid, and RDRP. And that uh, P2A, self-cleaving uh, sequence, then splits that polyprotein into spike and uh, nucleocapsid plus uh, RDRP, right? Yeah. yeah and the, they've the, got AAY there, and I still don't know what that is. So the... the Nucleocapsid in the um, RNA polymerase were included as a single polyprotein downstream of, so the polymerase and N are together, but they're fused to the spike, right? Right. Is that correct? Yes. 
Uh, and then, yep. then they're going to be separated from spike by this two, this self cleaving. Basically, it's a four amino acid sequence from apocornavirus with it. The ribosome pauses and then starts again. And so you have two proteins. There's no protease. It's really remarkable. And okay, worked, fine. Wherever Good. you put it, it Thank works. You. It's great. Good. Uh, Tesco virus 2A. Tesho. I knew Tesho. Okay. I knew Sorry. you would know what it was. I mean, I hear oh. people say that all the time, so I assume it's correct. But it's a town, well, in, it's a city in Germany, I believe. Then Tesh, it should be Tesco. Tesco? Uh, well, yeah, no, maybe fine. you're right. Yeah. So I'm, uh, yeah. one of the things I was thinking about as I was looking at this is that they chose to use uh, just the S1 domain, not yes. S2. Yes, yes. Um, which makes sense because that's got the uh, receptor binding domain, though it might be better to use the whole thing. On the other hand, uh, I wonder if they run into uh, cloning limits in uh, adenovirus. If they want to stick in these other antigens, uh, I don't know how much room you have in one of these adenovirus vectors. This comes out to be about 3.5 mm, uh, kb, yeah. which is about as big as spike intact, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I don't know if they've got more room than that or if there was some other logic about using just the spike domain, but... That's the story. So they have the P2A uh, between um, the spike and the nucleocapsid, but they have an AAY between nucleocapsid and RDRP. Do they say what the AAY no. is? No. <laughs> I don't know what that is. The P2A is different. I mean, P2A is labeled P2A, uh, but AAY... Nowhere can I see that they tell me what AAY is, which is, uh, you know, I used to drill my students right and left. Everything that's in a figure has to be described somewhere, preferably in the legend. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, so, but the bottom line here is despite our lacking Creeping. some information, Kvetching. Kvetching. they yes. make, they put these adenoviruses and they make three proteins, three individual proteins after this. They make spike S1, they make uh, RDRP and nucleocapsid protein. Right, so they call all their vectors throughout the paper try Hugh Ad and yeah. try Chad, right. Chad. Ad. Try Chad. Let's try go Chad. surfing, Chad. <laughs> yeah, so they do a West. They do. They make these vectors and they infect cells and they do a Western blot and they show that the proteins are made, which is good to do before you start all your yes, work. Yes, that's a, a nice thing to check. <laughs> so they do that, and that's that's very nice. Okay, then um, they're going to. Put these, they did a safety test in mice. <laughs> they, they simply gave these, so they're going to be given intramuscular and intranasally, both. Uh, and um, they just do this and they look at body weight. They look at bronchio, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. You see, you put a little saline in the lungs, you pull it out and you see if there are any more cells than you would think, you know, in any infiltration of immune cells, you look for cytokines and um, no, they look for hepatic toxicity, renal toxicity based on some enzyme markers. And all this looks good. What they can't do, of course, is look for symptoms because the mice can't tell them if they feel badly. <laughs> but that'll happen later in people, presumably in the safety test. So this is a Part of the preclinical assessment. I presume they would go into another animal at some point if they want to take these. Uh, and one of these vectors wins in the end. So the one vector forward wouldn't be surprised if they did non-human primates, for right. example. Well, and they did say when you were talking about that before, um, they've recently begun a phase one clinical trial to compare these two COVID-19 vaccines following inhaled uh, aerosol delivery to mRNA vaccinated humans. Uh, wow. They're going to do both, huh? Yeah. That's fine. <clears throat> okay. So I'm not convinced this is uh, Chadox. They say that, uh, uh, or Wiki says that Chadox is uh, chimpanovirus serotype Y25. Okay. And mm -hmm. this is something different than that. Okay. Unless they are synonymous, which I doubt. All right. So now they um, get, now they're looking at antibody or immune responses first. Uh, antibody responses, um, uh, and they're looking at antibodies against the spike protein. Intramuscular, intranasal immunization with one dose of either vaccine. So it's a single dose testing. 
They collect serum. They collect bowel, right? Bronchoalveolar lavage. I don't want to say that every time. So bowel. Can you remember bowel? It's not an air, it's not an airline. <laughs> it's it's a fluid out of from the lung. B A L were collected from the mice two and four weeks after immunizing. They measure IgG against spike and RBD by ELISA. Of course, the control mice, which get an uh, empty vector, they don't make, they make very low responses. Uh, and then uh, the, the antibody levels go up uh, following, um, actually in serum, uh, it's higher um, for after the intranasal immunization for the tri -hue. Yes. Uh, the human adenovirus. And then they see that for four weeks, the two point time points that they say it's sustained for four weeks. The tri-chad also uh, had a greater spike in RBD-specific IgG responses in serum than IM delivery. And they both induce antibodies to uh, N protein as well. Okay. Then they so, look so that, that right away that interests me because I've thought about this before that a mucosal yeah. immunization gives you serum IgG. Yeah, it's okay, right? It makes sense. They're affecting okay the mucosal because then the, there's, there's capillaries underneath. Yeah, the cells are moving down the antigen presenting cells, so that's good. I measure neutralizing antibodies now. This was just ELISA four weeks. They initially use a um, some kind of pseudotyped virus with the spike, which they call a surrogate virus neutralization test. Um, immunization route had no effect on neutralization of serum antibodies in tri animals, but intranasal tri-CHAD had markedly enhanced neutralizing potential um, over that by IM or by tri immunization. So this is, I think, the first indication of what uh, Kathy was talking about, which is the in this particular test, the chimp adenovirus is working better than the human yeah. adenovirus yeah. factor. Yeah. Uh, and then they look in the bowel fluids for antibody responses, right? Which is good. Uh, and they only found an uh, antibodies there, spike-specific antibodies, after intranasal, not intramuscular immunization. And the responses following tri-chad were doubled compared to tri-hue. Tri-chad right. just ro rolls off the tongue, doesn't yeah. it, tri-chad? tri-chad. Great. I, is this the discussion of uh, 1-H? Because yes. I had a question about that yeah. when I yeah. look at 1-H. Yep. Um, you know, what they say is what you just said, Vincent, that they don't see anything I am. intranasal with the human, but that's not true. They're, it's just the same low thing. Okay, it's less than 10 to the 2, so maybe, the, but it's still above their dotted line, which I think is... Yeah, they say the same reliability. Must be limit of detection, yeah. 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 So there's some there, but not much. Yeah. And there's no significant difference between intramuscular and intranasal. The, 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 in the whole experiment, the only really great signal they get or the most the, the best signal they get is with the intranasal with the chimp head. Yeah. Although with the human, the the intranasal does cluster much more tightly. Mm -hmm. True. So there's something going on, but not significant. Oh, but we don't know what we it is. We don't know what it is. Yes. <laughs> there must be something happening here. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess you guys are all old enough to get that. Oh, yeah. I heard my parents um, playing. Yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's not old enough. Oh, good. Uh, so then they asked, uh, how does the antibody response look at eight weeks after vaccination? So they said compared to four weeks, the serum uh, spike in RBD-specific responses were, were, main, were largely sustained uh, following intramuscular but we're higher, as we saw before, following intranasal immunization with either vaccine. And serum neutralization was also similar at eight weeks and four weeks. Um, then they did this neutralization assay with SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, we, and they say similar results. I am immunization with either vector uh, gave minimal neutralization of SARS-CoV-2. So intramuscular with either one. This is one dose, minimal neutralization. Intranasal, uh, both vectors induce neutralizing antibodies, but the tri-chad, they, they call superior neutralization capacity compared with tri -hu. Um And the BAL, now what about the BAL? This is serum. BAL uh, fluid, the spike antibodies were somewhat increased at eight weeks following intranasal immunization. And again, tri-chad higher levels. Intramuscular with either vaccine failed to induce anti-S in the airway. This is just measuring using virus. And they also look for IgA. They only found anti-spike IgA in BAL after intranasal immunization with tri-chad. Very specific. IN, tri-chad only, IgA. Okay, now, how about memory B cells? Um in the lung and in different lymphoid tissues. So they are staining um, cells. They're looking for uh, RBD-specific B cells by flow, sort, flow cytometry. Um, and um, again, they found in the spleen, so that's one place they're looking for these B cells, memory B cells. All the immunization gave detectable uh, RBD-specific B cells. So they make a reagent. They take RBD and they conjugate it to a fluorochrome, and they use that for flow cytometry, basically staining cells with it. So RBD-specific B cells in the spleen. The trichad induced higher levels than um, but intranasal, higher levels intranasal compared with trihu. And only trichad IN induced detectable RBD B cells in the lung. It's interesting, right? They both you both you find them with both in the spleen, but only one. I guess they leave quickly, right, from the from the mucosal surface. I don't know. All right, so let me summarize, and I'm I'm happy that they summarize uh, mostly. That's good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Single dose intranasal immunization, particularly with trichad, induces superior. Functional humoral responses systemically and locally in the lung compared with the IM route. All right. I just looked up this uh, surrogate virus neutralization test. Right. It, in fact, is a kit. Oh. Fr <laughs> from from GeneScript. Uh, what's that? It? it does not have any virus in it. It's got it some... Looks like it's got receptor binding... It's got uh, it's got uh, an uh, an ACE two molecule on ah. some surface or something, and it's got a receptor binding domain protein in it that's tagged in some fashion. No, so and it's looking for basically. blocking the interaction right. between the receptor binding domain and the ACE two receptor. Okay, okay. I'm look, just looking at a cartoon Good. here from that's, Gene Script. Important. Good, thank you. That's important because then it's even more important that they did infectious virus, right? Yes. Yeah. To confirm that, excellent, excellent, very good. Thank you. All right, so then they looked at T-cells, looking for antigen-specific T-cells in the um, bowel fluid two and four weeks post-immunization. They looked um, for intracellular cytokines that are, uh, you know, typical of what you would see when uh, you, you stimulate a T-cell with a peptide and it response to it. They make these cytokines. So they you, they measure those. And they're interferon gamma, TNF alpha, IL-2, and granzyme B. And they add peptide pools. So they have peptides synthesized for spike S1N and RDRP, right? So they're adding these pools to the um, cells taken from the mice and asking, are there any T cells that respond to the peptides by making these cytokines? All right. So the... Uh, Intramuscular immunization, they don't see any antigen-specific CDA-positive T cells in the airways, no matter which vector, which vaccine vector they used, okay? Interesting. Intranasal immunization, there you see uh, 
virus peptide specific CD8 positive T cells, specific for all three of these uh, proteins in the airways. And they, they say the spike specific T cells were dominant compared to nucleocapsid or RDRP. It's interesting. Um, and TriChad induced greater CD8 positive T cell responses uh, to the three antigens. Uh, they also looked at CD4 positive T cells and get similar similar results. Okay, so there are these. Uh, IN is is very good at uh, inducing these virus specific T cells, and particular TriChat. Now, when, when I looked when I looked at this, I saw uh, a much stronger signal to spike. Yeah. Than either nuclear capsid or RDRP. Yes. Very <laughs> right. much stronger, and I'm thinking to myself. Meh. Uh, but we'll come back to that. Okay. By the way, did you, I, because I was away looking at <laughs> uh, <laughs> surrogate virus neutralization assays, did you discuss this uh, figure 1N about the, um, wait a minute, did that have uh, the ratio? No. The spleen and lung. The, the ratio. IgG. Uh, the ratio of uh, uh, yeah. the two IgGs. IgGs. Yeah, only oh, trichad yeah. induce RBDs. You're thinking of a different figure. Right? I'm thinking of a different figure where they have because uh, this this idea of um, whether you're uh, preferably inducing a Th1 or a Th2 response is important. Mm. And I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if you got there yet because I was lost. Oh, it was in F. That same figure. One F. Is where they do the F. ratio of uh, yes. IgG two A and IgG two A. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that, and that's yeah. important because the conclusion from that is you're tilted towards the Th one response, which is the appropriate response for a virus. We've yeah. gotten into yeah. trouble with vaccines in the past by vaccines being tilted towards the Th two response instead of Th one. Right. They also looked at multifunctional CD eight T cells, virus specific or peptide specific. In other words. They can do more than one thing. These the CD8s can make cytokines. They can kill cells. They can be cytotoxic T cells. So um, they say the majority of the spike CD8s induced by either vaccine were multifunctional. So they they co-express both interferon gamma and tumor necrosis virus alpha. Whereas the net, the uh, N and the RDRP T cells were mostly monofunctional, have one cytokine or the other. It's interesting. So granzyme B is an indicator of cytotoxicity, uh, and they find that IN immunization with both vaccines gives you um, cytotoxic CD8s against all the antigens, but tri-CHAD induced greater frequencies of these cells uh, than tri -HU. And cytotoxic T cells are good, right? They will kill the virus infected cells. Right. Uh, they, they also looked for uh, antigen-specific T cells in the spleen. Again, IM, but not IN, uh, gives you good uh, systemic CD8-positive T cells to spike at N and RDRP. And the spike T cell, again, responses are dominant compared to N and RDRP. So, once more, let's summarize in their words. Single-dose intranasal, but not intramuscular, Vaccines, and particularly TriChad, able uh, induce multifunctional CD8 positive T cells with cytotoxic potential within the respiratory tract. All right. We're good. All right. Now, memory T cells. You want to have memory T cells induced because those are the ones that the functional, the effectors, the functional ones, you know, they do their thing and then they're gone, but the memories are around and they can respond later on. Right. So, do you have, and you, you uh, identify uh, memory T cells by specific surface markers. And they, they produce these, uh, they, they pull the, the lymphocytes out of the mice and they look for these markers. And then they produce these maps. They're called TSNE maps, um, which combines the, the results for CD3 positive, CD8 positive, CD4 minus cells from the lung tissues at different times after immunization. And they can get a sense from this of the, the memory population. And my understanding of uh, these TSNE plots is that it's just a way to model 
potential correlations in the data. And there's yeah. there's a bunch of math and computer algorithm stuff going on in the background. And the, the assumptions you make and the way you build these models determine a lot about them. Um, I mean, if you just glance at this figure, what are we on figure three here now? Yeah, um, yeah. You might at first say, "Oh, what kind of histology is this?" But they're not. <laughs> they're not histologies. Like these are not tissues you're looking at. These are distributions yes, of yes. data points it, that have yeah. multiple dimensions of information. But we can't draw a five dimensional plot. So how do you plot that in two dimensions? And they've they've designed these so that that these correlations will pop out. So evidently, uh, Cindy Leifer did a really nice explanation of these, and I think people sometimes call them Tisneys, Tisneys. on one of the immune episodes. Yeah, it stands for T distributed stoca stochastic neighbor embedding, and it's as Alan said, useful for multi-dimensional data. It's a way to combine a bunch of parameters down so that you can, in this case, put it on a two-dimensional yeah. plot. Can tell I'm not an immunologist because I didn't use the right pronunciation. Tisney. Tisney. Yeah. Well, I hadn't heard that till Brianne said it. So. Yeah, I'll look it up. I'll see what episode that is, so folks can go listen. So, if you look at the Tisney maps, you see two unique clusters. These are of CD8 positive T cells, only after intranasal immunization, not with any of of uh, IM. So they say, okay. What is this? So then they look at what's being produced on the surface of these uh, cells. And the pattern is associated with TRMs, res T resident memory cells. Um, so th that's good. That's what you want. You yes. want T resident memory cells in the, in the particular tissue to be uh, induced by vaccination. So only intranasal immunization does that. All right, so TriChad induced more CDA-positive TRMs in the lung uh, than uh, TriHue. And, of course, I am, forget it, no CDA T-resident memory cells in the lung. So there's a pattern evolving here. Yes, there is a pattern. Chimps, chimps rule, man. Yeah. Chimps in the nose. Chimps, chimps in the in nose. Their <laughs> there's a show title. <laughs> All right, so then they look at these uh, cd 8 TRMs in the airways, eight weeks, eight weeks post immunization. Uh, they, they, so they do bowel and and um, they they see them there as well. Yeah, and uh, TriChat uh, tri is better than uh, Huad. Uh, they also looked to see whether these uh, long these are TRMs. They're long term memory cells. Uh, whether they're multifunctional. Um, and again, TriChad <laughs> makes them more multifunctional than uh, does TriHue. So to summarize, intranasal but not intramuscular immunization induces durable multifunctional respiratory mucosal TRM responses, and TriChad is better at doing this than TriHue. So these are, again, long-term memory T cells. All right, so then the next section is um, all about <laughs> you know, trained uh, immune, trained innate immunity, which we, Brienne has talked about a little bit. Yeah, and I, I, I talked to her today about this too because I had more questions and I'm not going to be able to convey all the information that she gave me, but I told her that my first image is <laughs> macrophages can do this. I'm picturing them in the circus dancing on some beach ball type <laughs> thing. Yes, they're and trained. Then, and then, yeah, because they're trained. And then later, as she started to say some of the characteristics and, and I found the, the paper about it, that they have several characteristics. One is that they have high expression of class two, but mm -hmm. this particular paper that the authors refer to also point out that they have increased glycolytic metabolism and produce um, neutrophil chemokines. And I'm not sure that the authors assay any of those. They kind of just go with this high class two yeah, yeah. expression. And so the way I'm thinking of that is, okay, we've got the macrophages in their they're dancing on the on the beach ball, but they're not juggling flaming things <laughs> and knives. You know, they're not. They don't have all those characteristics. Maybe just because we can't 
they just didn't assay for them. But. So this is not uh, this is not a pathogen specific trained immunity, right? Uh, well, I mean, that's I don't know the answer to that, but the idea is that you get exposed to some agent, a, a virus, or maybe even a vaccine, uh, and then when you get re-exposed, trained immunity can respond faster and greater, right? Which is uh, which is not usually what we would think of innate responses, right? But now people are getting evidence right. that there is some kind of memory. Right? So your macrophages are on high alert. Well, right. they, I guess and, there's multi components to trained immunity, right? Is, isn't that what? Right, and and so it's like you have evidence that eight weeks later they're still activated, and they shouldn't have been, except that maybe they've been stimulated. Yeah. And so they're still active or they're re-stimulated. But she said she would have wanted to see some kind of evidence of or something about um, epigenetic changes yeah, okay. or something. So it's maybe class two isn't enough to say that mm. it's trained. Yeah, so they're using these alveolar macrophages as a kind of surrogate for trained immunity. Um, and they're, in particular, they're looking at MHC2, which so high surface e MHC2 is like, uh, is one characteristic of trained alveolar macrophages, right? But there are other things you could look at too. Um, and so basically, uh, what they find is that um, let me go to the summary. Okay, <laughs> single dose respiratory mucosal immunization uh, with these vectored vaccines induces trained airway macrophages. Um, in addition to the effects on, on B and T cells that we've already talked about, apparently induce uh, trained macrophages. Um, yeah, IM doesn't do this. The, the data say IM barely gives you any high MHC2 alveolar macrophages, but the, uh, the uh, intranasal immunization does that. And this is going to come into play. So remember, <laughs> this is going to come back to... Uh, Provide some interesting nuances, I think. All right, so um, what about now the virology? <laughs> Do these responses protect against infection? So they use a mouse-adapted SARS-CoV-2 MA10 that we talked about a long time ago, uh, I believe produced in the Barrick Laboratory where they uh, serially passaged uh, the virus uh, in mice and it, it sustained several spike changes that... Uh, uh, allow it to bind mouse ACE2 and infect the mice. And by the way, some of those same changes you, you, we then subsequently saw in some of the variants of concern and so forth. So uh, you take just wild-type Belpsy mice, the same mice that are being used here, and now you can, um, uh, inf you can immunize with one of these two vaccines, IM or IN, okay? And then you challenge them four weeks later with what they call a lethal dose, 100,000 PFU of this mouse-adapted virus, MA10. That challenge, I didn't look this up. Is that is that intranasal? It says so in the little diagram. Yeah, okay. yeah it's intranasal, yeah. Okay, and they look for weight loss and mortality. Initially, all the unvaccinated animals died by five days post-infection or reached humane endpoint. Uh, I am immunization with either vaccine failed to protect. 80% of the animals uh, reached a humane endpoint by four to five days. However, intranasal immunization, so the trihu, slight transient weight loss, and then they rapidly gained their weight back. I and Chad, tri Chad, were fully protected, no weight loss whatsoever. So 5% weight loss in the trihu. No weight loss in the tri-chad. All right, so that's weight loss and death. And they said, let's take some lungs out. They have some mice, which they sacrifice two days after challenge and see how much virus is in the lung. Um, and this is very interesting. Intramuscular immunization with either vaccine, only modest effects, modest reductions uh, in viral titers in the lungs. Um, intranasal immunization uh, did did better, and it, depending on what vector uh, you looked at, the tri-chad had the most reduced viral burden over three logs over 
thousand fold. Can I say fold? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Getting very sensitive here, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, thousand fold compared to uh, over tenfold reduction with tri hue. So a thousand with tri chat, about ten with tri hue reduction of viral titers. And remember, they both recovered. So the one lost five percent of the weight, and the other hardly anything. So that one log reduction is very interesting. Um, th then they looked at lung pathology. So the intranasal with trishad, they say very much reduced lung pathology at 14 days. Severe pathology seen in unvaccinated animals. Uh, intranasal delivery of the empty vector didn't give them any protection. So they say these data show a correlation of the relative magnitude of vaccine-induced mucosal B and T cell immunity and trained innate immunity, which they already we already talked about, uh, and and the protective superiority of trichad over trihu intranasal. So it's correlate, right? Because they show right. we we see these other things, and here's the protection against disease. Okay, so that's interesting. But then they say what's the contribution of uh, the separate immune responses, B cell immunity and T cell immunity. Right. What if we took away at, parts of this response? Take it away and just look at intranasal because the intramuscular is uh, not really carrying its weight here. And they use trichat here. So they uh, have mice uh, that are basically are B cell knockout mice. They're deficient in the J segments of the heavy chain. So they don't have mature B cells and they don't make circulating IgG. And then they have another line of mice that don't have uh, CD4 or CD8 T cells. All right, two uh, actually, they that's a depletion experiment. Uh, sorry, they're that, depleted, yeah. yes. Yeah, that's uh, and I found the, the protocol there interesting, not being an immunologist. They uh, wait until significantly following the immunization to do the T cell yeah. depletion because they want to look at whether or not T cells alone are important, but the T cells are important for getting full B cell development. Yeah. Right. So they do the immunization and they wait until the B cells are cranked up and then they deplete the T cells so That's that you right. can look at the absence of T cells uh, while the B cells are still around. Yeah. And they give the mice a T cell depleting antibody cocktail. All right. Not a cocktail I would like to no. have. No. So, um, unvaccinated wild type mice rapidly die, as we know before. Unvaccinated mice with uh, without T or B cells, similar weight loss kinetics, um, and reaching similar uh, points as unvaccinated controls. Now, trichad vaccine protected wild type T cell depleted and B cell knockout animals equally well. No weight loss throughout. Trichad intranasal. Yeah, it's only when they test it here. So it's, a, it's interesting. The vaccine protects you despite not having T cells or B cells against clinical disease. Implying that either response alone would be enough right. to protect you against clinical disease. In mice. In mice. Yeah. In mice. Okay, so then <laughs> what, about, um, what about viral loads uh, here? And, and what are B and T cells doing? So, uh, lack of T or B cells in unvaccinated animals, no, no difference in the lung viral burden. But intranasal trichad vaccination of, of wild-type animals, complete virus clearance at four days, which we already knew. Lack of either B T or B cells in these trichad vaccinated animals, uh, elevated lung titers, two to four logs. But no changes, right? We saw before in uh, morbidity and mortality. So they have more virus in their lungs, but uh, no no increased morbidity and mortality. Um, trihu, and here they do IN trihu. They protected wild type and B cell knockout mice, but vaccinated mice lacking T cells had a transient moderate weight loss and 20% of them succumbed to infection. Um, and these... In these mice, the there was only moderately reduced viral loads, two logs. Interesting. 
Um, <clears throat> so then uh, they look at... Um, so so uh, let me uh, put yeah, this yeah. together in my head here. <clears throat> uh, this is saying to me that in this experimental system... Right. Um, uh, if you knock out either T or B cells... Uh, the virus now can replicate in those animals right. Correct. better than in the uh, controls that have both a T and a B cell response. Nevertheless, despite that virus replication, you're not seeing clinical signs. That's right. Exactly okay. right. In terms of weight loss and mortality, right? Right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you'd see some pathology, but it, I don't recall them them doing that. That's interesting, right? You can have yeah. a, a good amount of virus and and no uh, clinical signs. Not inconsistent with kind of what we've been thinking. Yeah, yeah. All right. You can uh, you can have a little a little infection that you don't yeah. know about and be okay. Yep. All right. So what if you put them together? Take out both B and T cells. B cell knockout mice deplete their T cells, and again they. Um, they they do the the T cell knockout later to to give well these are B cell knockout mice right yeah but they say T cell help is required for trained innate immunity that's interesting um all right so they have the the double knockout mice um, intranasally vaccinated B cell knockout animals and B cell knockout animals depleted of T cells. Um, unvaccinated mice, uh, you know, significant morbidity and weight loss, but the vaccinated mice, uh, so we have B cell knockout animals depleted of T cells with intact um, trained innate immunity, right? They appeared healthy, clinical outcomes. But intranasally vaccinated B cell knockouts lacking both T cells and the... Uh, trained innate immunity, T2, they had early weight loss and the most severe clinical signs, and they saw um, gross pathology, severe gross pathology in the lungs. So B and T cells with intact and uh, trained immunity, they're pretty well protected against clinical disease. But as soon as you take the trained innate immunity out, uh, and they have a... Uh, a specific way of, of doing that. I guess the taking out the T cells early, right? Gets rid of the trained immunity. Right. I think that's the prior yeah. T cell depletion, right? Yeah. Continuous T cell depletion. Yeah. Okay. So the, now going to uh, viral burdens, despite these near normal clinical outcomes, the B cell knockouts vaccinated with the B cell knockout with the uh, T cell depletion, they had a significant viral burden, although reduced. And again, so these are mice with uh, normal outcomes. Um, and if you lack both B and T cells and BT and trained immunity, you have high viral burden in the lung, which is interesting because if you lack both B and T cells, you have high viral burden, but you, you don't have clinical signs. Now, if you take out t trained immunity, you have clinical signs but they all have high viral burden in the lungs. So all these things are important. Yes. They're all important. But if you take away B and T cells, trained immunity still protects you. Right. What this is telling really me well. is that there's a lot of redundancy in the system. That yeah. you can you That's can kill one of these layers and you're okay. You can kill a different one, you're okay. You can kill a couple of them and you're still okay. But if you yeah. if you kill enough layers of the immune system in these mice, you do eventually get the pathology. Okay, summary. Um, Try Chad, I think uh, and there's one more experiment. Try Chad is, uh, is more potent than Try Hugh. Both humoral and T cell immunity are required for optimal protection, and vaccine induced trained innate immunity contributes to protection primarily by improving clinical outcomes while it plays a minor role in control of viral burden. Right. So, yeah, the difference between with and without trained innate immunity is clinical outcome. Viral burden is not affected. Isn't that interesting? Yep. Yeah. 
So the other thing about these summaries that they put after each section, they not only summarize the section, but they're kind of cumulative. They're yeah. building on and, and reminding you of the other things that we've learned. Yeah, the paper is very well organized in that fashion. Yeah. It takes you, takes you through it and sort of builds a story. And the remaining experiments, they look at some variants of concern and ask are these single-dose intranasal uh, vaccines, are they going to prevent, protect against those uh, viruses? And um, for this, they use a different mouse model. They use uh, transgenic mice where ACE2 is, is driven by, I think it's a keratin promoter, a human keratin promoter or maybe a mouse, I don't remember. It's a keratin promoter, and it's human ACE2 transgene uh, in the mice. And these are apparently extremely susceptible uh, to infection. Well, I think you, uh, you uh, are there, you, and they're using regular, well, obviously they're using the human SARS-CoV-2 rather than the mouse model. Yeah. I mean, because yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. in they order to do, do these experiments, you got to have an appropriate match between the spike protein on yes. the challenge virus and the receptor. Right. Yes. On the other mice, yeah, so you can't they, use the model. Exactly system. right. They want to use the ancestral virus and the variants of concern, and they don't, they don't want to mouse adapt to all of them. No, you don't want to right. do that. And the uh, ancestral one that they're going to use is an early pandemic strain isolated in Toronto, Toronto, <laughs> Toronto, <laughs> Toronto. Uh, and uh, what are the other ones? Because I've got the translations here into uh, Greek alphabet. Is it one point three five one three fifty one? Yes. That's beta. That's beta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, uh, 11529? Uh, no? Yes? Uh, uh, point one one no, something. No, 117 that, alpha. 117 alpha. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No 529. <laughs> so alpha and beta. Although I'd like to see all of them, sure. right? But they're yeah. probably working on it. Yeah. All right. So they just first showed that in this uh, mouse, the vaccines are similarly immunogenic as they were in the previous mice. Uh, and then um, they do a challenge study. Uh, they start with the ancestral SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they immunize them four weeks later. They challenge them with 100,000 PFU, right, with the early pandemic strain isolated in Toronto. Um, um, and the, the, the unimmunized and... Um, Chad, what? Uh, I'm, 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 what the hell is this Chad EV? Uh, uh, empty vector. Oh, sorry, empty oh. vector. Yeah, I haven't gone over that yet. They, they all have weight loss and, and death, right? Uh, ch Try Chad prevents weight loss and mortality, as we saw before. So very similar outcomes. Uh, interestingly, um, Intranasal trichad provided sterilizing immunity in the lung. So no replication in, these, in this mouse model. Uh, and all right. So then they move on to, to uh, alpha and beta. Um, and they first say um, serum from trichad vaccinated animals neutralized both ancestral and B117 viruses, but had reduced neutralization capacity, about 70% to uh, neutralize B1351 beta. So and the, they remind us that the beta virus is one that evades the first generation vaccines. Yeah. All right. So then they challenge the lethal dose of either variant, both unvaccinated and empty vector immunized, quick weight loss, and then reaching clinical endpoint five, six days in contrast. Intranasal trichad vaccine completely protects animals from morbidity and mortality of 117 for, for 1351. Um, majority of IN vaccinated animals were protected. So both variants. Viral burden in the lung at four days post-infection. Again, trichad immunized mice develop sterilizing immunity against both uh, 117 and 1351 in the lung. Now, it turns out that this virus in this mouse model that goes into the brain, and which is a, a, a weird outcome of, of this particular model, but um, 
that doesn't happen again after intranasal immunization with TriChat. So this TriChat IN protects against both uh, ancestral and these two variants of concern. And of course, um, that's good. Yeah. All right, so which of the antigens are important? <laughs> I was waiting the whole paper for this. Yes. I didn't know they were going to yes. do this. And I got here and I thought, oh, good. They did this. So they have new. They made new vectors. They have uh, uh, a bivalent and a monovalent uh, CHAD. So either NRDRP, that's the bivalent, or S at the S1 alone, the monovalent. That's good. I really like this. Yep. Um, it, just uh, I just looked to see how much time there was between when they submitted it and when they uh, yeah. revised it. It was five months, and so I, oh, when I yeah. got to this, I thought, oh, maybe this, maybe the reviewers made them do this. Uh, good point. Yeah. Mm, possibly, yeah. But. I mean, it's it's nice to have, although, I don't know, I wouldn't have required it. Well, you know, going back to the earlier part of the discussion, when we were just looking at the uh, T-cell responses um, to the specific antigens, I saw a whopping T-cell response to spike right. and something yeah. not yeah. so, uh, much less to the other antigens, which left me wondering all through the paper whether those other antigens were really doing you any good. Okay, yeah. which is to yeah. to me a really important point, and and here is uh, some indication of what's going on. All right, so intranasal here, no more. I am uh, by Chad protected mice as well as tri Chad against infection. So right there, it tells you that uh, the nucleocapsid and RDRP antigens by themselves have protective value. And and you would almost anticipate that because when you take out T cells or B cells, they're True. equally protected. Yeah. And the T cell, ep the RDRP and the nucleocapsid are probably mainly inducing the, the protective effect. I would guess is via T cells, not antibody. I don't know what the antibodies would do. Can't rule it out. But anyway, uh, uh, then uh, so intranasally, try Chad. <laughs> Remember, sterilizing immunity. They couldn't detect any virus replication in the lung. Uh, by CHAD, you have reduced lung titers by about three logs. So not zero. Right. Or undetectable. And so that's, that makes sense, again, because the, the by CHAD is, is not inducing neutralizing antibodies, right? So you're going to have a little infection and reproduction, and then the T cells are going to come in and stop it. And it, it makes sense, but... It doesn't matter that it makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to have the experiment. <laughs> Somehow I missed, do do we know that the N and the RDRP are not inducing any neutralizing antibodies? Well, they, they they do induce antibodies. They looked before, just binding antibodies. Um, oh. Uh, ELISA antibodies, yes. But they didn't do a neutralization assay. So that would be interesting, okay. right? Yeah. Because they could, maybe some other mechanism. It's not going to be blocking attachment, of course, but yeah, it could be. Any, anyway, so yes, that would be interesting. Um, then they, they do the, the same experiments in their uh, human ACE2 transgenic mice with B1351 challenge. Um, by Chad, you have delayed body weight losses Try Chad gives you the best protection uh, against uh, one three five one, and uh, Try Chad gives you sterilizing immunity in the lung. Whereas By Chad, you have reduced viral burden in the lung, and so similar to what we saw in the other mice. And then they looked at the S one producing the Mono Chad. Mono Chad vaccine and B1351 uh, infecting uh, the human ACE2 transgenic compared it to Bi Chad and Tri Chad. Um, unvaccinated and intranasally immunized Mono Chad animals, comparable body weight losses. Both it's interesting that they display this, they present these data differently. Mm. They don't have the, you know, that. 
Uh, well, it's, I guess it's not as extensive. They're only going out four yeah. days post infection. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a shorter graph. Days, yeah. I guess because they sacked the animals and looked at their lungs. Yeah. So, uh, bichat and trichat animals were clinically stable. They saw extensive growth pathology in the lungs of monochad, whereas bichad lungs were nearly free of pathology, as sh as did the trichad. So again, monochad is just making spike antibodies, gross pathology, and um, uh, not sterilizing immunity. So to me, this is a this is a really important figure because it it uh, it indicates that those two extra antigens, nucleic acid and RDRP, you don't know which one could be just one of them, could be both of them, but they're having an effect. They're doing some work. Yeah, yeah. indeed. And this has been a question that we've had from the get go: is whether you might be better with a multivalent vaccine than a monovalent vaccine. But the um, and and again here the bichad. And the monochad only moderately reduce viral load, right? But the bichad really protects you against clinical disease. It doesn't matter. The viral load doesn't matter. So to summarize, uh, <laughs> superiority, superiority of CHAD vectored vaccine when producing S, N, and RDRP over bivalent and mono, monovalent counterparts. Uh, and they say putting the NRDRP gives you additional protection via neutralizing antibody independent T cell and trained innate immunity. But uh, Kathy, they didn't look at neutralizing antibody, right? So uh, they did. They, I remember seeing that they did some micro neutralization assays with the with at the at some point and with the bivalent. Yeah, uh, I don't think no, not with the bivalent. It was much earlier in the paper. Anyway, this. Um, yeah, I think adding these two proteins is not a bad idea, right? I mean, what we don't know is how the, how this would fare against other variants that we have. You know, Delta and, and Omicron probably would be interesting. I'm sure they're doing that. And uh, the durability, how long it lasts. Of course, mice will only last a couple of years. Yeah. So, but um, you, you said, Kathy, they're doing phase one already in, in people, right? That's, That's what, what they, they say, say, yeah. At the end of their discussion, yeah. Cool. Interesting. Yep. I mean, I th I'm i very encouraged by this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's good. And I'd really like to know uh, whether there's uh, an efficient, whether the uh, adenovirus really has an advantage for the intranasal delivery. I don't know the answer. Yeah, to we don't know that because yeah. you would have to compare other platforms, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, I did try to highlight some of the reasons why they thought First of all, that the adenoviruses are okay to do this. They said something that I hadn't really picked up on, that the pre-existing anti-vector immunity is more prevalent in the circulation, right. that mm -hmm. is in the blood, right. than in the lung. But then also um, that, uh, that not only intranasal CHAD vectored vaccine was not impacted by the anti-AD5 immunity, but it also triggered T-cell responses to a additional antigenic epitopes. So there's something different about the CHAD, the chimpanzee adenovirus mm. compared to the human adenovirus with respect to antigenic epitopes. Um, so that it's much more potent. It, it, it's a little bit, still a little bit unsatisfying as to why it's so right. much yeah. better in yeah, every yeah. assay, but. So the other thing that uh, runs through your mind that they comment on in the discussion is uh, this uh, adverse effect that's come up with yes. the adenoviruses, mm. uh, which they call VITT, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Um, they say that it's likely related to, well, uh, they, uh, they say that likely related to activation of platelets and endothelium by accidental intrathelium. Intravenous. Uh, venous in, in introduction of adenovirus. Now, hmm. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'd like to see more on that, okay? Because I'm, I'm, I haven't seen, you know, I'm not omniscient here, but I haven't seen too much saying that it's the intravenous thing that's important about they, this. They cite thing. a couple of papers, but I don't know. They cite a couple of papers. We did do 
uh, a paper that I thought was fascinating that talked about the interaction <clears throat> between adenoviruses and platelets. And we had a, a discussion as to whether down the road there was going to be engineering of these adenovirus vectors to ablate that interaction. Okay. Right. Um, which I would imagine, you know, because adenovirus vectors aren't going away. So I would imagine that's in that's in the works. But one of the things that they say is that uh, regardless, and here they're emphasizing intravenous uh, component of this, that the respiratory uh, administration of the adenovirus may get around right. that. Now, whether or not there's an intravenous thing involved here or not, mm. I suppose that's a possibility that the adenovirus is delivered by a respiratory route uh, may not uh, have as high in incidence or maybe no incidence at all of that particular adverse effect. The, I don't know, but that's where The way I kind of read this was there. there's some, apparently some evidence that it may be accidentally intravenous introduction that causes this. And if that's the case, it would certainly fit nicely with what they want to be true, which yeah. is that their vaccine <laughs> wouldn't cause it. <laughs> um, so I, I think there's a, you know, there's some motivated reasoning going on here, but there's also evidence behind it. Well, it also seems, it also, uh, regardless of the whole intravenous thing, I can, uh, it's sort of, uh, it's truthy. Yes. Yes. Okay? It, it, that the, uh, that the intranasal administration route might be different yes. in terms of that particular adverse effect. Yeah. There was one other little thing that I highlighted in here. This uh, totally editorial. This is writing style. Okay. There's a phrase that I have used uh, and uh, a lot of people use that drives me nuts. Uh, when you want to, you know, you want to say something else. You've already said something. You want to say something else or you want to emphasize it. You say, it is noteworthy. That yeah. Yes. I can't, I can't stand that. So I say instead, uh, if I'm going to say anything, um, um, I forget what I say, but it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> they use the phrase here, which I really caught my attention, of interest. Mm -hmm. Okay? I like that. That's good. If I were still writing, I'd use that. <laughs> so I'm at the clinicaltrials.gov page. So, Yeah. They're testing both of these, ad and chad, try chad and try ad. Um, hasn't enrolled yet. Intranasal. Intranasal. Safety and immunogenicity of a single dose of either delivered by aerosol in healthy volunteers who have received two doses of an mRNA vaccine. Hmm. So this is going to be like a boost. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Yeah, if they because if you limited your trial to people who have not received a vaccine, you're going to have some real enrollment problems. Yeah, I yeah, was yeah, uh, yeah. I was just thinking that in terms of uh, it's also going to be difficult to look at genuine efficacy. Yes, of you know against uh, disease, going to have enrollment problems as well. We're getting to the point with all these, just like the vaccine trials in the kids. Yeah. Uh, where uh, you're kind of stuck with looking at what you think is a correlate of protection. Yeah. So 30 healthy volunteers will be enrolled. The first six will get either the triad or trichad at uh, 100,000, whatever they're measuring, a dose of 100,000. They don't say what the <laughs> unit is. It will be administered using the Aero Neb Solo Vibrating Mesh Nebulizer. Okay. Cool. Oh. <laughs> Assuming no safety concerns, the aerosol dose will be increased to 1 million to in complete enrollment. Antibody and T cell responses will be measured from BAL, collected at bronchoscopy baseline in four weeks and at several time points, and in blood at several time points up to week 48. Safety endpoints, nature of any adverse of events, their severity and probability, et cetera. Okay, good. You said uh, that's a million? One million. Or, they don't that's, tell you the, the unit. <laughs> well, still, I mean, assuming that that's a dose, Yeah. okay, uh, it, be it particles or whatever, that's like uh, five logs less, four or five logs less 
than I think what's used in the intramuscular yeah. injections. I think those are like between 10 of the 10th and 10 of the 11th. In this paper, I they, like use that P, right away. they use PFU in this paper, if okay. I recall, right? right. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask. Is it possible that the yes. CHAD is... <laughs> okay, <laughs> anything is possible. Yeah. Is it possible that the CHAD works better because... There's no trained innate immunity against it, whereas maybe there is against ad five. Is it possible that that's that specific? Mm. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Interesting. I, I thought they had mentioned that, but they didn't. Anyway, this seems very cool. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to the trial results, the safety, and then I presume they're going to do a phase two, and eventually a phase three, and um, be. Uh, be really interesting to see how this works six months after immunization, right? Where right. T and B cells have have contracted, and then what you know you get exposed, and and there's the delay of the memory response. What, what do you see? Do you get protection against mild, moderate, and severe, or just severe disease and hospitalization? Really interesting. So you know, for me, an important idea here is this whole thing of the perceived need for second, third generation uh, vaccines. Yeah, yes, that's a good Because part of me, part of me has been thinking, well, you know, we're going to get to a certain level of zero posit positivity, and then we're even going to be asking whether or not we need to keep vaccinating, yeah. okay, yeah, despite yeah. variants, because this is just going to be like a, a regular sort of human coronavirus that'll infect kids and not cause much problem and you'll get reinfected during your lifetime and get a cold or something like that but maybe that's not true and if that's not true okay then i can see vaccine development and uh you know second third generation vaccines uh being necessary and important mm -hmm. uh in uh controlling this long term i think i, I think i'm very it's glad also a platform yeah i'm very right? it's a platform i'm very glad that people yeah. are working on this but i don't yeah. think i would put any money in it um, no, beca why not? Well, because it is entirely possible that this is going to be a bust. Um, I mean, we already saw. You, you, you could say that. No, 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 no. It's, it's likely <laughs> this would be a bust because we already saw with Omicron an immense skyrocketing of infections. I mean, you can't even plot stuff on the same graph when you're looking at things like sewage samples. And you see this massive transmission of virus and yeah, a hospital's got a lot of patients, but you didn't. You, we didn't see the breakdowns in the system that we saw before because of so much pre-existing immunity between vaccination and exposure. Um, and I think we we may very well be getting to a point where the virus is the vaccine, and as Rich described, this will just become another common cold coronavirus. Um, at which point, these next generation vaccines will be a solution without a problem. Well, they might be a solution for naive individuals. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they might be something for uh, something that's so far from being a variant that it's not even the same species. Okay. So part of the discussion the other day was, you know, what's the definition of a virus right, species yeah. and, and so forth. No, so, as I say, I'm glad I, these folks are working on it. We may need it, but. Yeah, I think it's hard to say, but I think that. This attitude that it may be a bust is what got us into this in the first place. Nobody wanted to work on well, coronavirus no, right, right. vaccines, right? <laughs> but I think more than coronavirus, this could be applicable to influenza yeah. virus or yeah, some I was other, thinking, uh, right? RSV, yeah. The idea that you want to put more than the spike in is very powerful, I think. And that would certainly apply to flu where T cells, I mean, remember Fouché told us that the flu vaccines are really not great at inducing good yeah. T cell, viral specific T cells. So this could be great. I think it's a broader platform but the real mm -hmm. question is yeah if you if you sprayed mrna vaccines would you have the same effect and th that would be interesting right because well you could do both i don't know sure What's better there's uh there's there's <laughs> got to be data out there as a matter of fact i think we've even talked about this before maybe Nas we'll intranasal get uh, mrna yeah. vaccine yeah okay maybe we have but uh, i i like that this is going forward sure. i think it's yeah good. and i yeah. think the platform itself yeah. has tremendous potential yep and there'll be another coronavirus, and so you can rapidly adapt it yeah. to this if you get this through testing, right? Yes. Um, but um, 
I just, you know, if you listen to Daniel Griffin, he sees a lot of people dying from Omicron. They're unvaccinated people. Yeah. It can kill you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No question about that. I mean, it's mild in people who are vaccinated, but I'm not sure it's mild in unvaccinated people, uh, and according to Daniel. It's killing kids. More kids since, like, the end of the year than before. So, anyway, good stuff, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do some picks. Kathy, what do you have for us? Oh, I didn't know we were jumping to picks. Sorry. Um, okay. So I picked something that, uh, let me get down there, um, that uh, our friend Mary uh, in Washington State sent us. Uh, it's about uh, mega flash lightning, and they've just released information that there's a 477-mile-long mega flash uh, <laughs> That uh, was reported both in the Seattle Times and it originally was from the Washington Post. And um, so not only, yeah, so not only was there that one, uh, and it stretched from Texas all the way to Alabama. And then they also talk about one and how long some of these can last is on the order of 16 or 17 seconds, uh, one that was in Brazil. And then Rich pointed me toward um, the World Meteorological Organization that also reports on these. And here's a part that I find interesting. They, they draw you a map and they show the one going from uh, the coast in Texas all the way up to Mississippi. And then they say, this is equivalent to the distance between New York City and Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, like we couldn't figure out from the right. uh, Mississippi was a long distance. It's funny. And, or they say, or between London and the German city of Hamburg. Um, that, the second the one single, makes a little more sense because Europeans may not necessarily like, oh, well, what distance right. is that? Oh, well, it's okay. Right. Hamburg to London, right. that's big. Yeah. And then this other one that's in uh, Brazil crossing Uruguay, um, anyway, around 17 seconds. And it, it describes... Um, the fact that uh, these are going mostly horizontal rather than cloud to earth. And so um, there's just some pretty amazing records of lightning strikes. So, so Kathy was, uh, I got a text from Kathy saying that she was going to do this. And I'm glad you sent me that text, Kathy, because I was uh, working on this, which is why I knew <laughs> oh, about the world. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> That's, I have other things. That's what's what, no, it's why I was working on the world meteorological thing. Because anytime I see one of these news stories, I try and, you know, uh, poke around and see if I can find the original source or whatever. So I, I came across this word, uh, world meteorological organization thing. And the, the tidbits I liked in it, because it goes on about different things about lightning, is other previously accepted world meteorological organization lightning extremes are... <clears throat> direct strike, 21 people killed by a single flash of lightning as they huddled for safety in a hut in Zimbabwe in 1975. Wow. And the other one is indirect strike, <laughs> 469 people in drunk Egypt when lightning struck a set of oil tanks causing burning oil to flood the town in 1994. Uh, uh, so stay away from that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the biggest mega flash known? Yeah. This, this is, is a record set. Yeah. So, so how far. do they, uh, how is this recorded that they know it flashes over this whole length? Uh, do, right. Do you know? Currently, satellites. Satellites do it. Okay. And I guess they see it after the fact, right? They look at the pictures or whatever and. <laughs> Yeah. It happened if in I April. Were, if I were around in Texas and I was a meteorologist, I'd go, holy cow, that was something. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go look at the satellite data. So this but happened I, in April 2020. It's a while ago, right? Yeah. Actually, I think that they have satellites that are dedicated to looking at lightning. Okay. So it took a while for this to reach the press. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. Real. Well, and to, to be verified yeah. somehow. So, yeah, April 29th, 2020 for the one in the U.S. And then just a little bit later, uh, June 18th for one between Uruguay and northern Argentina. Oh, and then I missed it. There was some other, oh, Brazil uh, in Halloween of 2018. Mm. So it was a previous record. Yeah. All right. So then my Pretty last cool. question would be what 
makes this happen as opposed to just, you know, your isolated flashes? Does anyone know? I think that's the big question. Um, and looking at these, they kind of remind me of ham radio propagation um, data, mm. and there, some of which is, depending on the frequency, um, it travels through atmospheric anomalies that, that can occur with things like temperature inversions and convection. Um, so these are actually the kinds of conditions where you see certain types of radio wave propagation over these kinds of distances. And I guess one possibility is if you have a big enough storm system that's got the static charge in it, it can just do sort of a chain grounding out from cloud to cloud because they say most of this is cloud to cloud. It's not coming down. Um, but, oh, there it goes. Mm -hmm. um, as I, I think you just it's just the size of the storm system and the atmospheric conditions that form right. the conductor. They, they say all the mega flashes accompany MCSs or mesoscale convective systems. Right. <laughs> which are clusters of thunderstorms that often rage overnight and can occupy an area the size of several states. Also called bad flying hours. weather. <laughs> it stretched <laughs> 750 miles or more end to end. BFW. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, ba uh, back to your question, uh, Vincent, about the technology. They say that previous, assign uh, previous assessments yeah. uh, were collected by ground-based lightning mapping array networks, LMA. Okay. And uh, uh, they, they <laughs> acknowledge that those probably have an upper limit of detection. And currently, new instruments include geostationary lightning mappers, GLMs, on R-series geostational operator operational environmental satellites. Those are the GOES, 16 and 17. We've, I think we've referred to those before. Yeah. Um, they're orbiting counterparts from Europe. Uh, do a similar thing. So, you know, you got people around who are as crazy about lightning as you are about viruses, yep. Vincent. Apparently, okay? yeah. It's been Apparently. their whole lives. Uh, you, you ought to have a satellite that you could use to look at viruses. <laughs> <laughs> have to have a pretty We're big We're talking lens. big money here. <laughs> so, I mean, another question. I don't know anything about lightning. So, so lightning can go from the cloud to the ground, right? Those spiky things. But then it also can propagate like this horizontally, yeah. correct? Yeah. Right, yeah. So does this thing also have spikes or is it all horizontal, these big ones? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know either. And, and yeah. finally, are these bad, these big ones? Are these mega flashes bad? Bad flying weather. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be up in this. That's definitely the case. Well, I think your two questions are related, Vincent. <laughs> yeah. If it's staying in the clouds, you're probably okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Okay. Because people are looking at this stuff, so it must have some Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, lightning, they, well, as shown in the examples of the people killed in the hut and the flaming oil down the streets, I mean, <laughs> lightning can be very, very disruptive to yeah, your day. Sure. If if you look at the uh, the World Meteorological Organization site and you go toward the bottom, they've got pictures that show what look like the white spiky things mm -hmm. in these horizontal things. And then there's a YouTube video, which I'm reluctant to click on because probably it'll have lightning and thunder and, <laughs> and stuff. But anyway, I haven't looked at that. But um, uh, I looked at that. It was okay. It was a sort of a, a, a lay summary. But you can find uh, you can find YouTube videos that are the actual satellite footage. Okay, that okay. shows you this mega flash moving along. Okay, very cool. All right, thank you, Rich. What do you have for us? Um, I feel like we've discussed this sometime before, but I don't think I picked it. Uh, I have uh, a site. Uh, it's just an NIH site. That's the uh, NIAID uh, Global Research that describes um, how NIAID has a global outreach. I be and I picked a, a second site here that's a subdomain of this that's specifically NIA, NIAID funded research uh, in the African country of Mali, okay? And I was drawn into this because I had an opportunity a while ago to uh, discuss this research uh, with people. And in particular, I had an opportunity to interview a postdoc who was, uh, who was from Mali, um, who is funded by NIAID to come and work at the NIH for a couple of years as a postdoc and then go back to Mali, okay? 
and he was already uh, quite a legitimate uh, researcher mm. uh, coming from coming from Mali, having done a bunch of uh, a lot of, having to do with clinical trials uh, for malaria, and now he's coming to the U.S. to learn uh, a, a lot of more sort of laboratory technical stuff and be immersed in the uh, NIH uh, effort to tackle malaria and they have strong ties to this Mali program and then, and then go back to Mali. We've had this discussion before. I mean, it, it, what comes to mind is that, uh, in the flap about dare I say it lab leak. Okay. What comes up is, Oh, the U S is funding research in China to work on these viruses. And it's this terrible thing. And no, the U S is funding research all over the world, because that's a good thing, okay? And their quote from their, why do you do this, is why is global research a priority for NIAID? The impact of debilitating diseases such as HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis extends from individuals to families and into broader society. With infectious diseases among the primary causes of mortality and suffering worldwide, the morbid morbidity and mortality associated with these diseases in developing countries can slow or reverse social and economic development. Okay? So this is a good thing yeah. to do. Okay? And this site shows you that uh, the kinds of things they're doing and the global reach of NIAID in doing this. So I found this, there's a PDF link on this page, uh, which gives you a summary of their activities in 2020. So they invested uh, in 1,718 international product projects, total funding $719 million, 57% of that going to HIV AIDS, 25% biodefense, and 18% non-AIDS, non-biodefense. And the top funded country is South Africa, followed by the UK, Uganda, Brazil, Canada, Kenya, Peru, India, Australia, Malawi. I don't know why the UK is number two. I mean, yeah, South Africa, yeah. Uganda, Brazil. I could see the others. Oh, well. Um, that's interesting. Cool. All right. Thank you. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a um, sort of a local pick. This is out in Worcester. Um, just, just came across this recently from my local, uh, NPR outlet. Um, so the, one of the big things going on these days is the switch to electric vehicles. And, um, I keep saying as, as soon as a car company that I trust will sell me an electric vehicle at a non-exorbitant price that, you know, isn't an internet of things, security vulnerability, I'll probably buy it. <laughs> You're um, such a cynic. But I've got standards, you know, so, uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, but a big issue with electric vehicles and, and electrification of, of more moving things in general is the batteries. And it's most mm -hmm. of the cost of an electric car is in the battery. Um, so there's also the issue of where do these things come from? And it's, um, as we've all become a lot more aware of here in the everything shortage, that um, uh, supply chains matter. Um, and so there's this, uh, this startup company in Massachusetts that's trying to come up with, actually succeeding in coming up with better ways of recycling these batteries. And they, um, they've got a cool procedure that they've developed. They're, they basically take the batteries and grind them up um, and <laughs> into, a, into a powder. Um, and it's a little more sophisticated than that. And, that, and then they can re-engineer and rebuild batteries uh you know like six million dollar man they're better than they were um that was an obscure reference from a while ago wasn't it um but they they actually generate batteries that are that are not just refurbished they're they're superior to the ones that were originally made um and it provides this whole other pipeline for um for producing batteries that that could also ultimately be cheaper i thought it was cool i really like this highlighted quote says this is alchemy yes we call it chemistry but it's, it's alchemy. alchemy yes <laughs> so alan uh, you don't trust tesla i guess right? well i mean they've got a lot of stuff in there that doesn't need to be in there um that you know i it's not that i don't trust them necessarily the cars are, are have a lot of amazing technology but 
I wouldn't mind a car with a little less amazing technology that's going to have to have software updates frequently. And yeah. And, and the other manufacturers you don't like, well, I, right? Well, Honda makes, so we've got two Honda Fits, our, our cars. We uh, really like the car. It's wonderful. And they make- Is that an electric? No, or no. It's just a regular, just a regular old primitive gasoline engine, you know, okay. with a automatic transmission drive shaft like your grandparents drove. Um, and um, they're great little cars and they would make wonderful electric cars and they make an electric fit. Um, mm -hmm. But they won't sell it to you. They, they are available only in California, only for lease. Um, mm. And the, the reason for this is because the car companies, the dealerships, hate electric cars. Dealerships make most of their money off financing cars and fixing cars. And, and on a, an electric car, unless you have frequent software updates uh, for unnecessary yeah. stuff, you don't actually need to fix anything. I see. So, anyway. It's for us, that's the best part, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's no oil to change. There's no coolant. There's no fuel pump. There's all the stuff that fails on gasoline. Not all the stuff, yeah. but there's a lot of stuff that, that gets eliminated. Well, I mean, talking to Rich about his... Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I, I learned that the dealers for Tesla, you don't buy them there because they, do, they don't want to have any of this, yeah. this commission business. You just buy it online. I think that's great, yeah, right? That's great. Um. And you don't need oil, right, Rich? No, nope. nothing, man. <laughs> it's amazing. <clears throat> the only thing I've had to do with my Tesla so far in two years is uh, take it and get the windshield replaced because some truck kicked a rock ah. up into it. Yeah, that everything else is cool. everything else is uh, just fine. <laughs> I mean, tires? Say, what tires? You'll tires? need tires yeah. eventually. You add tires. Need, to your tires. You'll need tires eventually. Yeah, yeah. that's it. <laughs> well, and uh, you know, theoretically, eventually, you need brakes as well. Yes. But with the uh, uh, regenerative braking, I hardly ever use the brakes. Right, you get used to the regenerative braking, and wow. you hardly you hardly ever use them. So, I have to say, in terms of first of all, when we went shopping for the Tesla, we shopped other cars, and my this was a couple of years ago, and this is a uh, rapidly moving technology. But my impression was <clears throat> that all the manufacturers from Tesla took their gas cars and stuck an electric engine in, okay? Whereas Tesla obviously started with an electric engine and a computer and built a car yeah. around it. So it's completely reimagined, okay? And and it shows. Hmm. Um, uh, and, you know, it was just a, a completely different experience than the, than the regular cars. The other thing I have to say about the technology, and I was talking to, to Harper, my granddaughter, about this the other day, because we, we got into the car... <clears throat> and you know it uh the key and everything else is on your phone right and so when you when you get into the car it knows it's you and it adjusts the seats okay <laughs> um uh but if my wife and i get in the car at the same time we've both got phones that are keyed into the car okay and harper's question was mm. uh, how does the car how does know? it know <laughs> which phone i'm suspicious because it does it right most of the time i'm suspicious that the car knows which side of the car yes you're on. Yeah, probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have to say at the same time that there are times when it gets it wrong. <laughs> and there are times when it doesn't even, rec you know, you go out to the car and you got to open up the app and stuff to unlock the car because it doesn't know you're there. And it's a little disconcerting, okay, yeah. that the computer can have these glitches. Yes. And what other glitches might it have when you're going 80 miles an hour down the freeway? <laughs> There has never yeah. been a failure, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it does occasionally, you know, you do occasionally get these, uh, you know, oopsie, I'm taking control of the car when, you know, everything seemed fine. <laughs> okay. So there are little things that happen now and then. So I'm, 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 I'm hearing you about uh, the, yeah. the technology, but so far so good. <laughs> we're happy with it. Matter of fact, we were just talking today about how we need to get another test. <laughs> Get rid of the old gas pig. Well, I still have my, I like my manual yes, transmission right. cars, yeah. and I still, I love driving it. Although I hardly, uh, what? Well, that's, you better hang on to that manual transmission because you're not going to get another. Yeah, and actually, Honda, uh, the Honda Fit is available with a manual, but that's almost as hard to buy as the electric. Um, they're so, <laughs> very you know, I had a, look, I had a Beamer for 12 years, and, and uh, 2020, I, I finally got rid of it because, it was just 
breaking too much. It was too costly. So I bought a used Mini Cooper, uh, which no problem finding a six-speed. And they're actually making um, Mini Coopers still with six-speed transmissions. So right for now. But, you know, a lot of companies are, are backing out of it. I understand. Yeah. But I plan to keep this for a while. I don't. I hardly drive anything anymore. It's I didn't just know you got great. rid of your Beamer. Yeah, I, I mean, I was I was talked into getting rid of it, but now I drive like two miles to the train station. I could have kept it yeah. because it probably wouldn't have broken. Well, that actually, much. Not, I love not driving any car, car is even better for the for the yeah. planet than driving the best electric car. Yeah, so. I just wish I could walk because yeah. it's a little bit too far. It's a bit like an hour walk. Right. It's a bit too far. Um, a lot of the time, the weather is not conducive to biking. So I mean, I mean, right across. The train station, they built a brand new apartment complex. Yeah. And I'm like, boy, I wish I lived there. I could just walk home. <laughs> if you lived here, you'd yeah. be home now. If you lived yeah. here, you'd be home now. <laughs> uh, it's so cool. But then you get the train whistles all the yeah. time. I guess you get used to it probably, right? You do. But I I mean, in the in the winter when there are no leaves, I can hear the train, you know, four miles away through the woods. So. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure I'll get a electric car. Although I drove it in it with, with Rich. It's pretty cool. I like it. All right, my uh, my pick is something we do. Uh, it is called Q and A with A and V. Uh, this is something Amy and I started in December of 2020. We do a live stream every Wednesday night on YouTube, uh, and initially just it was set up to answer COVID questions, and now people ask all kinds of questions. Last couple of weeks, we've been getting over a thousand people <laughs> online, uh, and it's really a very vibrant community. Uh, you know, now we're starting at about 8.30. And when I get on there, there are already hundreds of people chatting amongst <laughs> themselves, right? And it's it's and they, they recognize that it's a cool, it's an international community. The other night, some guy from Finland said, it's 3.30 in the morning here, but I want to hear you guys. This is a lot of fun. So someone said, why don't you mention this on TWIV? And I said, oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, check it out. It's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it gets recorded and... Uh, the whole chat is there to uh, to replay as you're as you're playing it back. You can see the chat, the questions people ask, and so we take questions and try to answer them. So um, it's a lot of fun. The um, uh, what was I going to say? I had to get moderators though. Oh yeah, we have five five moderators who people who uh, were there from the start and volunteered to keep things in check because there's so many bozos who show up yeah. and try and disrupt it and say horrible things, you know? And I said to them, just keep it civil and no insulting. If anyone insults anyone, get rid of them. Right. So we need to have that and they make it more civil anyway. So it's very fun. Q and a with a and V we have um, two listener picks. Uh, Addie writes, hello, Twiv team. Thank you for all the great science education. I was recently listening to an episode I had somehow missed from last summer about smallpox, 822 Viking variola variants, and thought you all might enjoy the mini podcast series, Vaccines, Vaccine, the Human Story. Dr. Annie Kelly is a sociologist specializing in extremist movements and brings great perspective. It's only five episodes long and covers the history of not only developing the vaccine, but also the trials of distribution and early anti-vaccination leagues. I found it a fascinating look into the factors that led people to resist vaccination for something even as deadly, deadly and devastating as smallpox. Podcast is available everywhere. Their Patreon page lists the sources for all the episodes. I thought with the constant question of why won't people just get mm -hmm. vaccinated, this helped me understand just how difficult a task that's always been. Hope you enjoy it and find the history as fascinating as I did. Get vaccinated, Addy. Cool, yeah, cool. That's very cool. Thank you. And Jenny writes, Hi, Twivers. Throughout the pandemic, I have relied on Twiv as a constant source of scientific and public health information, and you have helped me make decisions to keep myself and my family safe. Sometimes, though, it's good that she wrote that instead of but. <laughs> but. <laughs> Sometimes, though, I have wished for a simple framework or guidance that would give me metrics to help me assess safety in my community and to trigger different choices about non-pharmaceutical interventions. I track the test positivity rate and other data from my county, but I didn't have a straightforward way to make decisions based on the data trends. My listener pick of the week is this post by Dr. Kat Caitlin Jetelina, a.k.a. your local epidemiologist. 
Is it Jetalina or Hetalina? I don't, don't know. It could be Yetalina too. Yetalina. Right. Could be with a Y. And colleagues yeah. use test positivity rate in county level cases per 100,000 to trigger specific individual mitigation measures. For example, the positivity rate in my county is currently 16%. So I know I need to take the precautions in the red column. When the case rate falls, though, I can relax my measures with some confidence that I'm still taking reasonable precautions. I love this framework because it takes the guesswork and anxiety out of the equation. I sincerely hope that someday we will all be in the blue column. Thanks for all you do to teach your listeners about viruses. Cheers, Jenny. That's cool. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, very cool. good. I've passed that on to a few people. <clears throat> And, and indeed, we would love to all be in the blue column. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I wonder if they chose that color on purpose. You know what I mean, folks, yes. right? All right. Uh, that is TWIV867, microbe.tv slash TWIV for the show notes. That's where you'll find all the links and so forth. You can send us your questions, comments, picks to TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. We're a 501c3, a nonprofit, so your contributions here in the U.S. are federal tax deductible. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. You don't have any snow on the ground, do you? Oh, yeah, we do. How much do you have? In fact, when you were talking about the uh, walking, it it is a good way to get from here to there, but yesterday and today have been a little bit treacherous in the morning because the ice is still there in some mm. spots. I'm going to make a point of going home while it's still light out so I can spot all the yeah. slick spaces. Yeah, it is slippery. Here um, in front of Madison Square, Penn Station, they have a lot, they're doing a lot of construction and there are construction plates on the sidewalk and man, are they slippery. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I have slipped so many times. I don't even go now on there. I go underground. I find all the ways to go underground. <laughs> I found a way. So I walked two blocks to Penn Station and I, on the corner, there's a New Jersey transit entrance. I can go underground and walk. So that's 7th Avenue. I can walk to 9th yes. Avenue, one block up and I come out and there's B&H photo right on the corner, <laughs> which is where I go. So you walk underneath the old post office and it, Kathy, you asked me a while ago about the uh, the new train station. It's the Moynihan train station and you walk through that it's gorgeous they have built an incredible open space and there are lots of restaurants and stores and you can walk all the way through that to ninth avenue and sure you're go, going underneath the old the post office uh, it's it's lovely and it, you can so i can make my trips to to b and h now all underground <laughs> I have to go outside i know that's a first world issue i know sorry about that folks Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He's Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to this week. In Virology, thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon with another TWIV is viral. <laughs>